uh, once again, praise the Lord. And uh, we, we thank him for his mercies, for being with us and uh, guiding us so that uh, we may be able to enjoy uh, these sessions and be able to be blessed together. And uh, I'm just praying that uh, his will may be done in our lives and uh, we may continue drawing closer to him. This is the most important thing. And uh, I believe that uh, Christ is uh, willing to do more exceedingly abundantly than uh, we may ask of him. And uh, if uh, we avail ourselves for the blessings of the Lord, they will surely be poured upon us. And so I want to welcome you to our number 12 in the presentation, the uh, prophets and the messengers. But this is number three of three of the presentation, verbal inspiration or thought inspiration. And uh, you can... Uh, watch the previous presentation to know more about what we have covered and uh, i believe that uh, the lord will continue blessing us as we study together and uh, if uh, you need uh the notes of the presentations i'm more than willing to avail them so that uh, you may go through them at your own pace and uh, you, you may be able to analyze everything for we are told, let us test uh, every spirit, take that which is good and uh, that which is not profitable, um, uh, leave it alone. This has been always our stand that uh, we are not... Um, beyond correction. And so I'd like us to be able to pray and uh, just uh, start uh, the presentation of the day. I want us to pray and then we can start the presentation of today. Our Heavenly Father, glory and honor be unto thee as uh, we look at the last segment of this uh, presentation. Uh, I pray that uh, heaven may be opened unto us to understand what you're speaking to us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, I want to welcome you to the last uh, presentation of verbal inspiration or thought inspiration. And uh, this is in the series, uh, The Prophets and the Messengers. In this last presentation, I want us to look at uh, the 1919 uh, general conference and peep through behind the scenes of what was happening there and uh, just see how people from that time started to look at E.G. White and her writings. It is interesting when we go through these things and uh, I'm presenting this not to bash anyone. I'm presenting this not um, to cast a doubt on anyone, but just to have a background information of what was happening at that time. The 1919 Bible Conference, one of the most heated sessions in Adventist history, discussed passionately topics as the Eastern question, the Aryan Trinity, our controversy, the two covenants, the daily of Daniel 8, 11 to 13, beginning and ending of the 1260 years, and the king of the North, Daniel 11. At the heart of it was the issue of how to interpret Ellen White and her um, uh, and her writings. Uh, should she be understood in the light of verbal or thought inspiration? How far should we be able to take her materials? When should we quote them and when should we not quote them? Are they on the same or par with the Bible? Or how do we treat her materials? Missing in that conference, you can uh, guess who was missing in that conference, none other than the son of the messenger, that is uh, Willie Cla Clarence White. But we ask ourselves, why was Willie White missing in that meeting? And uh, Herbert Douglas tries to give a glimpse of this in uh, Messenger of the Lord, page uh, 438, 
to 439 and that is what i'll be actually going through why was willy white missing and what are the issues that were at stake in that meeting Herbert douglas says some wonder why willy white was not present at the 1919 uh, meeting as a member of the general conference committee he was automatically a delegate and did receive the uh, Mimio graft invitation Perhaps after looking over the agenda, which included nothing in the work and relevance of Ellen White, he felt this time would be better spent in the Elm Shaven office. Working alone after his mother's staff and dispersed in 1915, no, no budget allotted by the trustees, not even provision for a letterhead, White felt pressure to finish compiling councils on health to satisfy the request from medical leaders. If anyone had been able to predict that two long days of discussion that arose spontaneously would have been devoted to his mother's prophetic role, he doubtless would have made a greater effort to attend. But uh, since when he was invited, these were not the things which were on the agenda. Actually, he saw it fit that he would finish up another work rather than be there. But then things cropped up in that meeting that if W.C. White would be, have been there, things could have been dealt with differently. Willie White, the most valuable source person available, could have answered some of the questions more accurately, more constructively than anyone else. Perhaps with his experience and communicative skills, he could have helped to focus more clearly the issues that were seriously dividing church leaders and lay people at the time and for years to come. And we are stuck in these issues that divide us about E.G. White's inspiration. That focus would have led to a careful forthright examination of the facts regarding the work of a prophet in modern times. Cutting away mistaken ideas would have been painful for some, but the healing would have been quicker and longer lasting than the widening gap of content that followed the conference concept. However, another aspect must be considered in this issue. For many church leaders at the conference and in the field, Willie White was suspect and had been for 20 years as being one of the liberals. Why? Because he had been emphasizing that his mother's writing should always be understood in context with time, place, and circumstances, determining, de de determining their meaning and application. Uh, Willie White, with, da with uh, A.G. Daniels, Wilcox, and later Prescott, represented those who were thought inspirationists, thought though that term had not been used at uh, that time. Now, this is what uh, Herbert Douglas has to say uh, on this issue once again. Um, this is what uh, Herbert Douglas has to say uh, on the issue once again. Often at, uh, I'm sorry, often, at uh, the heart of the controversy with Dr. J. H. Kellogg and A. T. Jones was the issue of how to interpret the statements uh, of uh, Ellen White. These two articulate leaders, these two articulate leaders eventually use Miss White writings only when they seem to support their views. That is uh, Dr. J. H. Kellogg and A. T. Jones. They only used E. G. White materials when she supported their views. Part of Johnny's attack on Daniels was based on Miss White's comments regarding the unreliability of general conference leadership in 1897, and then charging that the same statements applied in 1906. On other occasions, when they found difficulty with her writing, their response was that someone had told her wrong information. Often, that someone was in their mind her son, uh, William White. And uh, from 1999 to his death in 1937, Willie White's contribution to the facts surrounding the prophetic ministry of his mother was enormously helpful. And here on, uh, uh, on this uh, contribution, Herbert Douglas says, beneath the differences of the delegates and many of the ministers and lay people in the churches, over such agenda topics as the Eastern question, the Aryan Trinity controversy, the two covenants, the daily, in Daniel 8, 11 to 13, beginning and ending of the 12, 60 years, and the king of the North Daniel 11 was the issue of how to interpret Ellen White. Accusations of disloyalty to her 
of unfaithfulness to her uh, authority by picking and choosing her writing as to what was inspired of un unsafe leaders leading the denomination down a fearful path without the guidance that she had given the denomination for 70 years. All such a spirited words directed at general conference officers and those among the teachers in the colleges who supported them did not bring out the best in people on either side. And uh, you know, Every time we sit to thrust upon uh, other people by using her writings, it doesn't help the leaders. It doesn't help the people. It only leaves doubts, scars, and much things to be pondered upon. But at the end of the day, it doesn't help much. And uh, we can go through the previous presentations and see how do we use E.G. White. And the most important um, um, Thing that I hate to say about how to use EG White material is if you use her, use her in representing a character fit for heaven. Just like we saw in the book of Romans that uh, the name of God is blasphemed by uh, amongst the Gentiles by us when we say we are Christians and behave like unchrist, the other people take that this is how uh, the people of God behaves and because they claim to have the spirit of god this is how god himself is now if we claim to quote eg white and then we behave in a natural way an unchristian way they say the spirit behind the material is what is leading them and this is what the spirit was uh, the, the, the 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 messenger herself or himself was made of and so the best way to use eg white material we have the statements which say never quote her in public that says um, not quote her until you are at the vantage ground on your Bible and you are walking according to the will of God. I say the best way to quote her is to live a life that is a Christian. And when you quote her, you will not bring uh, 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 a doubt upon her name and all that. And so, uh, again, uh, Trusting these quotes on peoples and quoting when they are good for us is not the solution for everything. The conference council was charged with tension the moment it opened. At stake, each side believed was the authority of Ellen White. Each side further believed that on this issue would hang the future of the church. So Herbert Douglas says, both sides verbal and thought inspirationist had much of value to hold on to but neither side saw the hard truth for which the other was contending. Thus, they missed the transcending healing nature of the ellipse of truth. Neither side saw clearly the biggest reason why the ministry of Miss White had made such an enormous impact on their lives, though each appealed to their own experience under her guidance as undeniable. Neither side will see clearly that her distinctive message, her coherent, integrating theological principles were the foundation for her, for her guiding concepts in education, health mission, and the Adventist theological uh, teachings. And uh, this is not something new. This is not something new. You see, many times when we come together, the issue is everyone wants to hold on what they believe on this, their side of the story without listening to the others. We have become so professional in not listening. And, uh, you know, one person uh, was telling me, we always talk about the little home. And what is the most impact, uh, uh, important aspect of the little home? The little home has a mouth to speak and the mouth speaks blasphemies. But the little home doesn't have ears. That is how we have become all along. We do not have ears to listen. We haven't cultivated the patience of hearing others what they are saying and understanding what they are saying. But we have a mouth ready to speak. And in, in, in many aspects, we are not different from the little horn because it has a mouth but doesn't have ears. Go to Daniel chapter 7, you will see that it just have a mouth to speak but doesn't have ears to listen. That is the kind of Christianity we are practicing, papal Christianity, where we can speak, but we cannot listen. And this is what was happening in 1919, 1919 delegate meeting, that people came there to speak. People did not come there to listen to each other. 
And so it became a very heated conference. And so the foundation principles understood as the great controversy theme were the reasons why the policies these leaders had followed were so effective. They had been living so close to the rapidly developing church and the equally rapid change in national and world condition that most of them had not stepped back far enough to see the bigger picture. Both sides saw these undeniably wonderful results in education, health, and rapid church growth, and they wanted to protect their divinely guided messenger from the use or misuse of her writings. Each side saw the other as the ultimate problem when they perceived what seemed to be lack of appreciation for the gift of prophecy in their midst. These are not new things. A lack of appreciation on what the other person is speaking. And it stems from not having the ability to listen to what that person is talking uh, about. And so continued on. But uh, the downside of these two positions was played out in the lives of some of the most eloquent partisans. Many contributing influences affected Dr. John Harvey Kello, but probably none was more crucial than his understanding of how revelation and inspiration works. The, effect, the eventual drift of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagoner, spiritual heroes of 1888 and the early 1890s, was largely caused by the same misunderstanding. Kellogg and Jones especially held to a rigid concept of virtual verbal inspiration without using the contextual principle for understanding Miss White's statement. And uh, they don't look at the larger picture and how her writings should be used um, uh, being able to place things in time, place, and context of who was being read, uh, written these things and why were they being written and what could, how could they be used in the future. But some of those contending for thought inspiration found themselves on the other side of the slippery uh, slope. Though they had a clear grasp of how God speaks to the minds of prophets, Few seem to possess the inner core of Ellen White's message that provided the theological structure for her global contribution to theology, education, health, and mission. So the people who are defending the thought inspiration found themselves um, in a place where it was so hard to defend this uh, unless they uh, drifted into another slope of downplaying the materials of E.G. White. And so those who were contending for verbal inspiration were seemingly uh, are stronger than those who are leaning on thought inspiration. Um, as time passed, some of these otherwise able leaders had nothing to hang on to when they began to separate what was inspired from what was not. When they said that Ellen White could not be trusted in historical and medical matters or even in administrative and theological issues, where would they stop? If Ellen White could not be considered an authority in these matters, how could she be considered authoritative in others? And uh, the issue of authoritativeness really stemmed from canonical versus non-canonical. Yesterday, or in the previous presentation, I was able to deal with uh, how the non-canonical messengers of the Lord are just as the same as the canonical ones, and how even the people, the Old Testament prophets who are non-canonical were believed by the people whom they were sent to. Now, in the New Testament, we are told that these gifts will be in charge for what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and uh, for unity, and then um, to help the people be able to stand into truth, both spiritually and intellectually which means that they will be standing doctrinally right. Remember, the, the gift is in the church until the end of the time, and the Bible was written some years ago. And so the prophets will be in the church. They will not be adding anything in the Bible, yet they will be a guide to the people in the end time so that they may not be tossed here and there by winds of doctrines, which means they will be also authoritative in, doc in doctrinal matters. Others who contended against the verbal inspirationists did not accept or perhaps did not understand this larger, more constructive reasoning. The thought will be expressed for whatever reason. While I believe that Ellen White is a prophet of God, I do not believe that all she writes and all she says is inspired, 
In other words, I do not believe in verbal inspiration. And immediately they said this, now there was a war that you are now cherry picking what to believe and what not to believe. And so those who hang up on uh, verbal inspiration uh, 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 thought that those who are saying that some things are inspired, some things are not inspired, they thought that uh, those who held to thought inspiration were diminishing the writings of the prophets. But as we saw, E.G. White herself said that common things must be spoken. Common businesses must be talked about. And things which are not inspired, common talks must be talked about. And yet people took everything to be inspired. And when others find that she had made a mistake in uh, the, the rooms that were in a certain building, then uh, uh, to others it becomes that she was not inspired. So that kind of thinking, if not severely modified, is an open door through which many have walked away from the Adventist church over the years. Such a thinking leads to personal judgment as to what a prophet means and to personal judgment as to what is inspired and what is not. This is truly a slippery slope if there, were, if there is not a prevailing fundamental message to hold on to. At least verbal inspiration is new in their minds how to hang on to authority, even if it might not have been for the right reasons. Those of this group, and there were many who remained in the church as strong leaders in administration and evangelism, believed that they were the only ones left who could save the denomination from apostasy. They could point to many who tried to reinterpret Ellen White as examples of where such a thinking will lead others, men such as Bellinger, brothers AF and ES, J.H.L. Kellogg, uh, E.T. Jones, W.A. Colcord, E.J. Wagner, L.R. Conrad, and W.W. Fletcher. That uh, those who didn't believe uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, a verbal inspiration, uh, those who didn't believe in verbal inspiration, uh, the other leaders thought that that is what actually led them to apostasy. Now, commonly to all these highly visible leaders who defected was their decision that the spirit of prophecy could be divided into inspired and uninspired portion. It seems relevant that in most cases, those who began to make such a determinations eventually lost confidence in the spirit of prophecy. And so I think the most fundamental problem that was with thought inspiration is, is to go beyond to divide the material into inspired and uninspired portions. This is actually a step that should have never been taken. But again, we have those who believed in verbal inspiration. And they didn't help out those who believed in thought inspiration because now they could not explain these discrepancies that we had in E.G. White writings, like common mistakes, like uh, what was uh, uh, the number of the rooms, what were the historical dates of uh, some of the events uh, uh, that she wrote about. And so both sides were not helping each other. I want us to, if we don't understand anything I'm presenting, I want us to understand one thing that the biggest problem that was in this meeting is a lack of people listening to each other and trying to help each other get a footing in what they were saying. And uh, I'm not saying that the Trinitarian doctrine is true, but most of the time, we do not give each other time to listen to each other and what somebody is saying. Once a person starts speaking, another one concludes this is where they are headed. Once another one starts contributing this, it is believed that they are headed in this direction. Lack of listening. And uh, you know what the Bible says, uh, I'll backtrack a little bit and go to the Bible and just bring out a verse that um, talks about this issue of uh, not listening to each other. He who speaketh without uh, hearing the word, it is folly unto him. Uh, Proverbs 18.13, uh, I'll direct you to Proverbs 18.13. 
Proverbs, sorry, Proverbs 18.13. And this is what the Bible says. This is the problem we are facing today. This is the problem they faced then. And it will ever remain a problem if we are not going to solve it. He that undereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. No one was listening in 1919 Bible conference. Everyone had their swords drawn out in the meeting. And everyone had a final decision on what they believe rather than bring together their thoughts and discuss uh, the issues at uh, the table. Now, this is what Herbert Douglas says about uh, this conference. And it is interesting to see what he says. He says, evident that the conference council did not appear to change anyone's mind is reflected in later comments. On one hand, A.G. Daniels wrote to Willie White that we stand together more unitedly and firmly for all the fundamentals than when we began the meeting. On the other, J.S. Washburn, a highly visible representative of those who opposed Prescott and Daniels on their positions concerning the daily, the Eastern Question ETC, wrote an open letter to Daniel and the General Conference Committee expressing the concern of many. In referring to this so-called Bible Institute, where teachers were undermining the confidence of our sons and daughters in the very fundamentals of our truth, he quoted one of our most faithful workers who said that the Institute was the most terrible thing that had ever happened in the history of this denomination. The issues that surfaced in the 1919 Conference Council remain today reflected in at least three of the four positions that divide Christians generally and Adventists specifically. Number A, those who believe that biblical writers and Ellen White were inspired but were not given propositional truth. Interesting. Those who hold that biblical writers and Ellen White received divinely dictated truth and that their messages were given as God wanted the writings to be read or heard. This is what we call verbal inspiration. Those who believe that the Bible and the writers of Ellen White, the writings of Ellen White are divinely inspired by God impressing thoughts on the prophets' minds who will then convey the message in the best language and thought frames at their disposal. And this is my position, myself. This is thought inspiration. This number eight, those who believe in that biblical writers and Ellen White were inspired but were not given propositional truth, which means that um, Actual what they were, they were given was not uh, absolute and it can be changed or something of that kind. Um, uh, it can have a paradigm shift. And then we had the verbal inspirations, then the thought inspiration, which I am among them. Those who believe that the Bible and the writings of Ellen White are generally inspired by their value is more pastoral than theological. And uh, this is actually what happened in 19, uh, 2015 when they said that she's more of a pastoral uh, person than a, a theological person, that her writings cannot decide on theological issues. Number A and number D is the most dangerous that we can ever have. And number B, verbal inspiration, actually it ties people in a box that they cannot come out of. Now, how was the Bible given itself? Let us just look at this. We did in the last series, but uh, I'll just uh, take a little look at this. The Bible is not given to us as in grand superhuman language. Jesus, in order to reach man where he is, took humanity. The Bible must be given in the language of men. Everything that is human is imperfect. Different meanings are expressed by the same word. There is not one one for each distinct idea. The Bible was given for practical purposes, and that was the sentiment of E.G. White herself. The stamps of minds are different. All do not understand expressions and statements alike. Some understand the statements of the scriptures to suit their own particular minds and cases. Pro pre prepositions, prepositions, Positions, prejudices, and passions have a strong influence to darken the understanding and confuse the mind, even in reading the words of uh, the holy writing. 
the disciples traveling to Emmaus needed to be disentangled in the interpretation of the scriptures. Jesus walked with them, disguised, and as a man, he talked with them. Beginning at Moses and the prophets, he taught them in all things concerning himself that his life, his mission, his suffering, his death were just as the word of God had foretold. He opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. How quickly he strengthened out, he straightened out the tangled ends and showed the unity and divine verity of the scriptures. How much men in these times need their understanding open. The Bible is written by inspired men, but it's not God's mode of thought and expression. It is that of humanity. God as a writer is not represented. Men will often say such an expression is not like God, but God has not put himself in the words, in logic, in rhetoric, on trial in the Bible. The writers of the Bible are God's penmen, not his pen. Look at the different writers. It is not the words of the Bible that are inspired, but the men that were inspired. Inspiration acts not on human words or his expression, but on the man himself who under the influence of the Holy Ghost is imbued with thoughts, but the words and thoughts receive the impress, receive the impress of the individual mind. The divine mind is diffused. The divine mind and will is combined with the human mind and will, thus the utterances of the man are the word of God. And this is in manuscript 24, 18, 86, written in Europe by E.G. White herself, 1 SM 20 to 21. And so, God takes the people and they become his penmen, but the expression is given in human language that uh, men may be reached wherever they are. And so the creator of all ideas may impress different minds in the same thought, but each may express it in a very different way yet without contradiction. The fact that uh, the differences exist should not perplex or confuse us. It is seldom that two persons will view and express truth in the very same way. Each dwells on particular points which his constitution and education has fitted to appreciate him to appreciate. The sunlight falling upon the different objects gives those objects a different hue. Through the inspiration of his spirit, the Lord gave his apostles the truth to be expressed according to the development of their minds by the Holy Spirit but the mind is not crammed as if, as if forced into certain uh, mold. And so uh, that is letter 53, and you can find that in 1SM, 1, uh, 1SM page 22. Again, this is what E.G. White says in uh, 1SM 22.3. 1SM 22.3, she says, the Lord speaks to human beings in imperfect speech in order that the degenerate senses, the dull earthly perception of earthly beings may comprehend his words. Thus is shown God's condemnation. He meets fallen human beings where they are. The Bible, perfect as it is in its simplicity, does not answer to the great ideas of God, for infinite ideas can be perfectly embodied in infinite vehicles of thought. Instead of the expressions of the Bible being exaggerated, as many people suppose, the strong expressions break down before the magnificence of the thought, though the penman selected the most expressive language through which to convey the truth of higher education. Sinful beings can only bear to look upon a shadow of the brightness of heaven's glory. And uh, I want you to think about this. When God is giving Moses the pattern of the sanctuary, the model of the heaven. Why does he give him in shadows, types, and symbols? Because man must be reached where he is in the language he can. What if God gave him this sanctuary in a grand way, in a language so sublime that Moses could not understand anything? What profit could it have been to him? And so God speaks to his messengers in a way they can be able to understand things. That is why some of the things we learn, they're only shadows and we understand in part. But when we shall meet our God, we shall be able to understand these things perfectly. And this is the thought that, more, uh, that uh, Paul had 
in First Corinthians chapter 13. I want us just to go to First Corinthians. Uh, First Corinthians chapter 13. And um, from uh, verses 9. First Corinthians chapter 13 from verses 9. Look at this. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. For now, verse 12, we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. And so when uh, we look at the messengers of the Lord, the prophets of the Lord, and how they were able to convey the messages they were given, this is not the perfect language of God, but his imperfect consenting to humanity so that the humanity may be able to interact with him until they come to perfection. And so the Bible should be understood not as a verbal book, but a thought, uh, a verbal inspired book, but a thought inspired book. God working on the minds of men and the men bringing information to the people in a way that they could understand and lead them to salvation. Now, a question also arises, and this is an unquestioned really that uh, people raise up. If E.G. White was inspired, why did she have editors? But this one can be answered so simple, simple, and we just pass on. If Jeremiah was inspired, if Peter was inspired, if Paul was inspired, why did they have uh, transcribers? Why did they have stenographers? And this is a simple question that can just be simply answered. And so uh, we have Jeremiah, Peter, and Paul had scribes for helping in writing messages that formed part of the canon. And so you cannot argue because a Jew white had editors, then she is not inspired. If you claim that, then Jeremiah is ruled out, Peter is ruled out, and Paul is ruled out. Remember, these are canonical messengers of the Lord, and E.G. White and others are non-canonical messengers. So if um, the stem and authority of the messenger uh, lies on them not having scribes or stenographers or editors, then as surely as it's still day and night, then Jeremiah should not have his writing in the Bible, Peter should not have, Paul should not have uh, 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 scribes. But if these people could have scribes, then also there is no reason for saying that E.G. White was not inspired because she had uh, uh, scribes. Now, this is uh, from uh, the Messenger of the Lord by Herbert Douglas, and this is um, what he has to say on this uh, issue. Ellen White employed literary assistance for the same reason that biblical writers did. She recognized her own limitations of time and literary skills. In 1873, she wrote in her diary, my mind is coming to strange conclusions. I am thinking I must lay aside my writing. I have taken so much pleasure in and see if I cannot become a scholar. I am not a grammarian. I will try if the Lord will help me at 45 years old to become a scholar in the sun. God will help me. I believe he will. She was often interrupted while writing and thus left tangled copy. Commending on this need for editorial assistance, she wrote, doing as much writing as I do is not surprising if there are many sentences left unfinished. In uh, a letter to G.A. Iwin, General Conference President, Willie White noted that his mother sought literal assistance, literary assistance because she recognized the varying quality in her writings. Sometimes when mother's mind is rested and free, the thoughts are presented in a language that is not only clear and strong, but beautiful and correct. And at times when she is weary 
and oppressed with heavy burdens of anxiety or when the subject is difficult to portray, there are repetitions and ungrammatical sentences. He further described the guidelines that his mother set for her literary assistance. Mothers, copists are entrusted with the work of correcting grammatical errors, of eliminating unnecessary repetitions, and of grouping paragraphs and sections in their best order. Mothers workers of experience such as Sisters Davis, Burnham, Bolton, Peck, and Hare, who are very familiar with her writings, are authorized to take a sentence, paragraph, or section from one manuscript and incorporate it with another manuscript where the same thought was expressed but not so clearly. But none of mother's workers are authorized to add to the manuscripts by introducing thoughts of their own. And uh, talking about um, not allowing anyone to introduce something new in um, her writings, this, um, this is what uh, uh, she had to say. And uh, I just pray that um, this will make some of uh, the things clearly. Uh, she said that, uh, let me just find the statement. This is in <clears throat> manuscript 188, manuscript 188, 1907, manuscript um, 188, 1907. I just read what she says about um, revising her words or putting in there something. They come to me, those that are copying my writings and say, now here is the better revised words and I think I'll put that in. Don't you change one word, not a word? The revised edition would not need at all. We have got the word that Christ has spoken himself and given us. And don't you in my writings change a word for any revised edition. There will be revised editions, plenty of them, just before the close of this earth history. And I want all my workers to understand, and I have got quite a number of them. I want them to understand that they are never to take the revised word and put it in the place of the plain simple word, words just as they are. They think they are improving them, but how do they know? But they may switch off an idea and give it less important than Christ means them to have. Take an example. If you find the statement that uh, the three persons of the Godhead or uh, there are three dignitaries in the heavenly trio, and you say that uh, um, this is the Trinity, exchanging a word for another. He says that you may switch the idea, which I do not want you to switch. This changing words with our own words, not meaning that the words are inspired, actually, there is verbal inspiration there, but um, just uh, taking the thoughts of somebody out of the context and giving there the words they themselves were never comfortable with, it brings about a paradigm shift which uh, she never wanted to be brought in uh, her writing. And so uh, by 1881, Willie White served as the editorial coordinator for his mother's literary assistance. Because Ellen White was either traveling or writing new materials most of the time, she chose not to be involved in editorial details. She knew that she would review all documents before they would be published unless she gave, on occasion, specific permission to a periodical editor to abridge to fit space. The record shows that they made few changes. A hierarchy of responsibility developed. For example, for minor editorial work, Marian Davis was authorized to decide matters herself. Larger questions were to be submitted to Willie White. Ellen White would make the final decisions as to editorial changes after both William and Marian had done their work. This is Messenger of the Lord, page 110, paragraph 4 by Herbert Douglas. Marian Davis had uh, occasions to describe her work as she saw it. I have tried to begin both chapters 
and paragraphs with short sentences and indeed to simplify wherever possible, to drop out every needless word and to make the work, as I have said, more compact and vigorous. The publishers hoped to keep Ellen White on their schedule, which was not easy during her heavy duties in Australia. Marian wrote to Will, Sister White is constantly harassed with the thought that the manuscript should be sent to the printers at once. Sister White seems inclined to write, and I have no doubt she will bring out many precious things. I hope it will be possible to get them into the book. There is one thing, however, that not even the most competent editor could do, that is prepare a manuscript before it is written. At times, Ellen White reached out beyond her immediate helpers for assistance. She explained this procedure to W.H. Little John in 1894. She said, I have all my publication, publications closed, ex closely examined. I desire that nothing shall appear in print without careful investigation. Of course, I will not want men who have not a Christian experience or are lacking in ability to appreciate literary merit to be placed as judges of what is essential to come before the people as pure provender thoroughly winnowed from the chaff. I laid out all my manuscript on patriarchs and prophets and on spirit of prophecy volume four before the book committee for examination and criticism. I also placed this manuscript in the hands of some of our ministers for examination. The more criticism of them, the better for the work. When she wrote of medical matters, her office helpers asked medical specialists to review the manuscript with care. I wish that in all your readings, you will note those places where the thought is expressed in a way to be especially criticized by medical men and kindly give us the benefit of your knowledge as to how to express the same thought in a more accurate way. Regardless of wherever she received editorial help, Ellen White read everything in final form. I find under my door in the morning several copies copied articles from Sister Peck, Maggie Hare, and uh, Minnie Hawkins. All must be read critical by me. Every article I prepare to be edited by my workers, I always have to read myself before it is sent for publication. Amen. Messenger of the Lord. This is Herbert Douglas quoting E.G. White in Messenger of the Lord, page 110 to 111. And so, uh, in looking at um, the work of E.G. White, why she had editors, and uh, if she were um, verbally inspired or uh, she received uh, thought inspiration, it is evident that uh, E.G. White received thought inspiration and not only her, but uh, the many messengers the Lord have used both canon call and non canon call. We enter into a very uh, hard place when we take her writings as verbal inspiration. And so when we find things that uh, seems to contradict history and or medical uh, fraternity, we, we really start doubting if she were a prophet of the Lord or she was not a prophet of the Lord. So, some may ask, if E.G. White was inspired, why did she have some things changed or some changes in her books when she was still alive? And uh, some may point to the great controversy, which I'll be handling fully, why there was those changes why there was changes. But um, I'd just like to say this in brief about um, why did we have these changes while she was yet still alive. In bringing this to a close, number three of three in verbal inspiration or thought inspiration, let me just briefly look into why was her writings in some places changed or modified. And then we shall be coming to the issue of uh, the great controversy, why such a changes had to take place. So let us wrap up this by looking at this. Why did 
we have changes in E.G. White's books while she was still alive. Sarah Peck, an education specialist, joined Ellen White's staff at the turn of the century. One of her assignment, assignments was to assemble Miss White's writings on the principle of education. Miss Peck soon saw that these material, materials divided themselves into two groups. Those most appropriate for the church now appear in certain sections of the testimonies, volume six of 1900 and counsels to parents and teachers, 1913. And those suitable for the general public are in education, the year 1903. While helping his mother prepare the 1911 edition of the Great Controversy, W.C. White wrote to the publication committee. In Great Controversy, volume uh, four, published in 1885, in the chapter Snares of Saturn, there are three pages or more of matter that were not used in the later editions, which were prepared to be sold to the multitudes by our canvassers. It is most excellent and interesting reading for Sabbath keepers, as it points out the work that Saturn will do in persuading popular ministers and church members to elevate the Sunday Sabbath and to persecute Sabbath keepers. It was not left out because it was less true in 1888 than in 1885, but because mother thought it was not wisdom to say these things to the multitudes to whom the book will be sold in future years. With the reference to this and to other passages in her writings which have been omitted in later editions, she has often said, these statements are true and they are useful to our people, but to the general public for whom this book is now being prepared, they are out of place. Christ said even to his disciples, I have many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. And Christ taught his disciples to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Therefore, as it is probable that more souls will be won to Christ by the book without their passage than with it, let it be omitted. Regarding changes in forms of expression, Mother has often said, essential truth must be plainly told, but so far as possible, they should be told in language that will win rather than offend. And uh, lastly, uh, Ellen White, uh, Ellen White's sermons were often published as articles in the Science of the Times or the Review and Herald. However, preparing them for the review was more, much easier than preparing articles for the science. Why? Because the reader, readers of the review were mainly Seventh-day Adventists and those of the science, primarily the general public. And so there you have why we had changes in higher writings. My appeal is that um, we may treat E.G. White on her own merits and treat the Bible on its own merits. She is subject to the Bible, as even Jeremiah will be subject to the Bible, and Daniel will be, and any other prophet who don't have, uh, uh, who have canonical materials. If they were non-canonical, they will be still subject to the scriptures. Note that um, the prophets which are canonical are more inspired than those who are non-canonical. But what we are saying is that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet, and no prophet will bring something so new that uh, the other prophet did not teach. And so I have tried to go through verbal inspiration or thought inspiration, and it's left unto us to examine these things if they be so. Take what is good, cast aside that which is not hel helpful. But the, at the end of the day, what the Lord is doing he is preparing his church for the final conflict before it. And he will use whoever they, he will use. Our work, as I said, is to have a personal relationship with Christ. So as we may have uh, a designing spirit, a studious spirit to be able to differentiate between that which is true and that which is not true. Think of the Bereans. That is what we are being called to do. They were noble and they could not even believe what Paul said, but they went and uh, checked on what he was teaching. That is what we have to do with E.G. White's writing. We have to check her. 
And I believe as we check on her, we will be checking on her on, and uh, our main objective will be how am I being benefited spiritually, salvation-wise? How am I growing as I try to critique her and read her materials? And uh, we pray that the Lord will guide us into all truth, for error does not sanctify at all, but only truth. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is the truth. And this is all that we want. And may the Lord uh, bless us. Shall we close with a word of prayer? Indeed, Father, you want to give all the gifts to your church for the work of the ministry, edification, and um, enabling your children to stand firm, both spiritually and intellectually, not to be moved by winds of doctrine. And whomsoever you shall use, if it be in understanding the canonical prophets and the messengers, if it be that, Lord, you will be able to send somebody or some people, as you have promised in Joel, Help us, help us to have the spirit of your son to be able to detect who amongst us are false prophets and who are the true prophets. May you continue to feed us on your word. And Lord, may you help us to reach out to others who are in darkness. That as you take away every filthiness in us and uh, the light shines upon our hearts, so we shall be willing that uh, we may reflect the same light to others. And uh, use us, Lord, as your messengers, as the vessels in the sanctuary. And for your own glory, may everything be reflected back unto you in our daily life. And above all, help us to have this brotherly love, to be able to listen to each other, not only to speak without hearing, because that is folly, but um, not to misinterpret our fellow brethren. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May the good Lord bless us and uh, we shall continue in the series, The Prophets and Messengers. And uh, we shall be looking as we continue uh, dealing with E.G. White and the challenges that are being raised daily. And uh, I pray that uh, God will help us understand more what um, he wants us to uh, accomplish in our lives and uh, draw even closer to him, be equipped for the ministry and uh, walk in that, that narrow path uh, as we draw to the close of uh, this earth history. Otherwise, bye for now and uh, may God bless you.